Amen. Well, we are in that familiar passage that we know that Frank read for us today called the Great Commission. And we've been focusing on missions here the last three weeks uh, at Grace Point. Uh, I like to think that we focus on missions all the time, and I think we do. But uh, this is uh, kind of the... Um, the concluding message, I know the mission, you said, well, I thought the mission conference was in, in October. It is. Well, it's November, and I really don't want us to lose that, the passion, the zeal, the excitement of spending time with those who have committed themselves to world, world evangelism. And so we're looking at this text, text of the, called the Great Commission. It's about our task. It's about the mission that God has given us, his church. And one of the things I wanted to point out right off the bat, is that a lot of times when we come to a familiar passage of Scripture, we have a tendency to go, oh, yeah, I know that one. I know that really well. I've heard 150 messages on that. I've heard it taught in Sunday school. I believe that. And what we typically do is we kind of just, we call it gloss over it, right? Uh, some of you might be glossed over right now. I'm just trying to see. No, I don't. No, I, you're all doing pretty good. But we don't want to miss uh, this what God is telling us here in this passage. We don't want to overlook the command of Christ. We always need to keep in mind that understanding the fullness of God's Word takes time and effort, and quite frankly, repetition. The more we have, uh, we have something in front of us, the more we start to take it in, and really it becomes a part of us. Now, I understand that God's Word doesn't change, but our perspective changes. I'll give you an illustration of this. This last week, I can't remember what day it was. It was the coldest day, I think. It was so cold and so clear that night that when I got home, the first thing I did, I got out of the car, and I looked up down our street, and I saw the constellation Orion. And it was so clear, I mean, so vivid. I could see every part of it. Now, it made me think, because just a few months before, I had trouble finding it. And I looked over, it was not in the same place. It was over here, there was a street light. It was cloudy, it was hot. Uh, there were different atmospheric conditions. I don't know, maybe my eyes weren't doing so well. But I had a different perspective on that constellation. Whereas the other night, everything was clear and I was able to see the fullness and beauty of the constellation. So today as we look at the Great Commission, let's keep in mind that God wants us to have a clear understanding of the text. And while you may have heard this text before, who's to say that God isn't going to show you something in it that just leaps up at you and takes hold of your very soul today? Because God's word comes at the right time. And this is the time to hear God's word. Now, it is no accident that these are the final words of Christ. It's not an accident. This is, this is strategic, okay? This... Uh, passage forms a hinge as it were along with the other great commission texts found in the gospels and acts it's a hinge between the life ministry death resurrection of jesus christ and the early church that we see burst forth on the scene in the book of acts this that's how important this text is it's it's a hinge last thing that he says to his disciples but not only is the timing strategic but the location is strategic as Frank read, it says that they had went to a mountain. Matter of fact, this is the seventh mountain in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus has gone to instruct his disciples and sometimes others that were there. For instance, in Jesus' temptation, we find that one of those temptations took place on a mountain. On Sunday nights, we've been preaching through the Sermon on the Mount. The sermon he gave on the Mount is important understanding of the kingdom of God found in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we have the Transfiguration, the Mount of Transfiguration. These are all theologically significant events. What is known as the Olivet Discourse, or uh, Jesus' teaching on the end times, on a mountain, Mount of Olives. And now here we come to this. Jesus is getting ready to leave this earth, the resurrected Christ is going to be the exalted Christ, ascend to heaven. And this is what he says. This is what he wants his disciples to hear. So the geographical context of the Great Commission 
underscores, further underscores, not just the timing, but the location underscores the significance, importance of these words. So today I want us to focus in and come to this text and think, first of all, about the basis of the Great Commission. And then secondly, I want us to think about the command of the Great Commission. And then lastly, we'll think about the promise of the Great Commission. So the basis of, of the Great Commission. We, we heard it read there just a moment ago, but look what it says in verse 18. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority. All authority. Jesus is established as the authoritative king. Why? Well, you might say, well, he's the second person of the Trinity. Well, yeah, you'd be right. He was sent by God. Yep, you would be right. But we also know he came to this earth and he came for the specific purpose of what it says in Matthew, the early part, to save his people from their sins. That's what it says about this baby Jesus that's coming. Jesus came to die on the cross. This, this was what he came to do. But he didn't come just to die. The Bible says on the third day, what happened? He arose. He arose. So Jesus has conquered. He's already conquered sin and death and the grave. And now, knowing this, he comes to us and gives us this command as the one whose lordship has been established once and for all. And it's with this authority he gives us the great commission. This is also a reminder of a very important distinction. The title of the message is, His Mission, Our Mission. His mission and our mission are two different things. Now you say, well, that doesn't make sense. I thought we were supposed to be on mission for God. Yes, but Jesus' mission was very specific. For instance, we're not called to go down the cross for people's sins. We're also not the second person of the Trinity. God had a specific purpose, mission, and plan. So you say, well, well so what would our mission be? Well, it is connected to his mission and flows from his mission. We are sent by the one who is sent. Uh, he's the conquering king. We're not called to conquer, but we're called to obey the king who reigns as a part of his kingdom. This is our mission. Our mission is not his mission, but our mission flows from his mission. His mission precedes our mission. There's no great commission unless Jesus does the work he was called to do. And it is on this, this basis, this is the basis for which we are to obey the command that we know as the Great Commission. Now think about this for a moment. If we just simply jump into the command, we will attempt to do something apart from his authority and power. I mean, and this is what's behind the command. This is so important. We know that Jesus told his disciples that they were to wait. They went in that upper room. Remember that? They began to pray. All those followers of Christ. And then something amazing happened. The one who Jesus promised would come, the comforter, the one that would guide them into all truth, would remind them of what Jesus taught, that he would come on them in power. And then, then, they would be launched out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. So it is always important that we remember the basis for what we do. Face it, we often try to do things for God in our own power, in our own strength. And when we do this, we often fail. We must remember that God's work precedes our work. Our, God's work always precedes our work. And we must remember that our work is a response to his work in our lives. These disciples uh, didn't do the Great Commission until they heard the Great Commission that came from the authoritative one. We don't work to access God's power. Uh, this is probably pretty important. You should think about this. We don't work. We don't say, well, I'm going to do the God's work, do God's work so I can receive his power. That's not how it works. We don't access his power by working. 
when we work in response to His work, we access His power. And we see God working through us. In other words, there's a million things we could come up that would be good things to do. A million places to go. Uh, we could do, you know, instead of three mission, tri- or three mission trips this year, we could do 15 mission trips this year. But if we do step out into places where God is not leading us, then we step out on our own strength and power. That goes to, for every aspect of our lives. So when we hear this Great Commission, we have got to understand the basis for the Great Commission. And it is Jesus authority as king. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That means all authority, everywhere, anywhere, any place, any time, any situation. It's his authority that actually matters most, not our activity. It's his authority. We are to obey based on this authority. Now, once we understand the basis for the Great Commission, we can truly obey Christ's command. And the command comes to us as an imperative. It comes to us as an imperative. Jesus is not just telling the disciples something that might be a good idea to try, something that might be a good idea to do. Uh, This is a command. He's telling them something they must do. You must do do this. Obedience is not optional. Now there is a controlling verb in this passage. Look in verse 19. And when we see it, it begins with go. And we may think, well, that must be the primary verb, but it is not. The controlling verb is actually, if you move into the text, make disciples. Make disciples. Go is certainly important. Jesus said it first, which has some significance, obviously. But the imperative itself is to make disciples disciples to understand this verb we need to distinguish between two parts we must preach the gospel this is the first thing we must preach the gospel inviting people to respond to the gospel how do we make disciples well we must go and preach the gospel we got to say something we got to tell something there's a message to share we got to be witnesses this is the first part of making disciples but there's also a second part We are to disciple those who respond to the gospel. Who is it that we're supposed to direct this attention to? Well, he says, make disciples of all nations. means Jews, Gentiles, you could put any, any people group, any nation in the world, any language group. They are the extent to which this commission goes out to. We're supposed to go to all the nations and preach the gospel wherever they may be in all the earth now this command that says make disciples comes with three supporting what we call in grammar I know some of you love grammar participles okay they're supporting verbs so we have go we have baptize and we have teach and these all support the idea of making disciples And we need to be careful of something when we come to these. I know sometimes what happens is we think, okay, so this is, Jesus is saying you go, then you baptize, then you teach, uh, as if they're steps in a process, but, but they're not. They all fit together as one. We must do all three. Go, baptize, teach. This is what it is to make disciples. This part of Christ's command when he says to go is often understood in a couple different ways. Some of you have heard these, these things before, but for some they see this go as Jesus saying, go, you go, get up. Like if I said, can you go get me a drink of water, which I got water, don't worry about it, but go get me a drink of water, Paul. I would be saying, telling you to go, get up, and go to do something, right? Go to witness. Another understanding of this word go that is often uh, given is that we are to witness as we go. You see the reverse? Go to witness. Get up, go to witness. The other is, when we leave today, I hope you'll stay and eat some chili. So let's just say after you stay and eat some chili and you go home and you go throughout this week, the idea that as you go, you are to witness to the power of God at work in your life and share the gospel. These are two understandings that we often hear 
when it comes to the word go in the Great Commission. And I would argue today that we need to not separate these two things or put them at odds with each other because I don't think they are in competition at all. We need to understand going in both ways because there is a danger if we do one against the other. If we only go to witness, then the idea in our mind is that we put a date on the calendar that we're going to get up and we're going to go tell somebody about Jesus. Now that is a good thing, but if we only focus on that part, we may not think it necessary to witness every day as we live our lives. If we only emphasize the one. On the other hand, there's a danger if, if we only emphasize witnessing as we go about our daily lives, then we might fail to intentionally go. When Jesus says, go, make disciples of all the nations. So it's not either or, it's both and. We ought to put it on your counter. Hey, if you have not thought about this yet, I hope you have because we just had the missions conference. I hope that you have thought in your mind, am I supposed to go to Brazil this year? Am I supposed to go to Ohio this year? Uh, am I supposed to go possibly to Jamaica this year? That may be a third trip we're looking at. I hope you've already thought about that. Am I supposed to go? You've got to put something on the calendar. I mean, if you really want to tell somebody about the gospel, a lot of times you have to say, I'm going to go tomorrow. I'm going to call them and say, can I come over tomorrow and talk to somebody about the gospel? Intentional, right? But that does not negate the importance of you, whether you're at the bank, the doctor's office, the gas station, the local park, the library, whatever, that you are ready to bear witness to the power and grace of Christ. Some of you may know this. I like, I like to fish. I do like to fish. I like to go fish. We got any fishermen in here? Any fishermen in here? Excuse me. Um, I find, typically I find, and Paul, I bet you can affirm this and James and the other ones. I typically find that when I uh, go to where the fish are, I catch more fish. In other words, if I get my fishing pole and I go out in the back 40 here, in the grass, big grassy area, I should not cast my line and expect really to catch any fish. I mean, that would be kind of weird, right? Our failure to catch persons for Christ may be caused by our failure to go on fishing trips. On the other hand, I find that if I keep my fishing pole and tackle box in the car, that I am likely to find a little bit of time to fish throughout my every day. I'm going to run up to Ottoman State Park or run out to Sandy Watkins. If I keep that stuff with me, I find that there is opportunity, even when I don't make a special trip, to fish a little. You get the picture? The Great Commission? We're fishers of men. And we need to go on fishing expeditions, and we need to fish wherever we can, while we can, when we can, in the busyness and movement of our everyday lives. It's both. It's not either or. Now, there's two other verbs that support this make disciples, baptize and teach. We cannot make disciples if we only focus on conversion itself, that there's more to it if we're going to make disciples. As a matter of fact, True conversion must include with it the concept of discipleship. We cannot and are not to separate the call to salvation from actually following Jesus as if it's part one, part two. That is wrong. It does not understand the gospel. The gospel presents to us ultimately two ways to live. If you... Uh, reject Christ, you are simply saying, I want to continue to live my life my way. It's just that simple. But the gospel says that if you uh, want eternal life, then you can no longer live your life your way. There's only one way you can live, and he's called the way, the truth, the life. His name is Jesus Christ. 
who lived and died and rose again. And you can either place your faith and trust in him, which includes allegiance to him as Lord, following him. Or you can say, I got this. I'm going to do it my own way. There, there's only those two things. Matter of fact, if you're here today, and you still, in your life, are doing it your way and not God's way, there's something that's not quite right. And the question is, have you received Christ? If there has been no transformation in your life, then you've only received a message, but you've not embraced the person that the message is about, there is an issue. There's a spiritual issue. And I would encourage you today to, to understand that if you're not in Christ, if you're lost, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, which means there is a shift in allegiance. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was also saying, you can't make it any other way. There's no other way to life. There's no other way to truth. This is it. And the decision to follow Christ is just that, a decision to follow Christ. Baptism represents a total break from the world in our former way of life. It represents a full identification with the Lord Jesus Christ and an inclusion into the body of Christ called the church. And, and teaching, when we think about teaching, teaching is we're to teach all that Christ commanded. And this represents this ongoing process of transformation in the life of of a true believer. Mind you, don't be confused here. I'm not saying that to be saved you have to receive Christ and then live like Christ 100% next day. It don't work that way. The shift is in the will. The shift is in the will. I, I always refer to it as our wanter. Everybody's got a wanter. You got a wanter? I got a wanter. Wanter is what we want to do. And when Jesus comes into our lives, our wanter changes. The things we want, the things we desire. doesn't mean everything in our life is fixed. doesn't mean we want perfectly and desire perfectly. But it does mean that there has been a change. New Christians need instruction in the Word of God so they can learn what it means to be obedient. As I mentioned earlier, the Great Commission has two parts. Initial conversion and obedience to Christ. Making disciples is the goal of going, baptizing, and teaching. The point I'm trying to make here is that making disciples is more than just enlistment. Now we had several veterans stand today. We had several veterans who stood up today and we recognize them. And we are reminded that a soldier is not made merely by enlisting. He must be formed. He must be trained. He must experience battle. Obeying the Great Commission is not simply enlisting people. If we focus only on the first part, conversion, then we will fail to make disciples. And it is true, if we, fa if we only focus on the second part, of, then we may fail to preach the gospel. The point is, that evangelism and missions, they must be holistic. They must cover both of these things. If non-Christians are not hearing the gospel and not being challenged to make a decision for Christ, then the church has disobeyed the first part. And let us not fall into that danger. Let us not say, well, we're, make, we're too busy making disciples to make converts. That would be wrong. That would be disobedience. But on the other hand, um, we need to understand that if we fail to make converts disciples, faithfully and lovingly nurturing them in God's word, then we have disobeyed the other part of the command. We are called to be evangelists and disciples. Now, I don't know how many of you have had surgery. I have not had very many. But could you imagine 
if you were to have surgery only to find out that there would be no stay in the hospital. I'm talking about serious surgery, not outpatient. No stay in the hospital. No follow-up with a doctor. No physical therapy. No medicine even. What would you call that? Medical malpractice. I believe you would, wouldn't you? You would not be happy. So it is with making disciples. If we fail to disciple those who respond to the gospel, we would call it spiritual malpractice. We just say, hey, pray this prayer. You're in. You'll figure it out. That's spiritual malpractice. We have got to make disciples. This is the call of the Great Commission. And making disciples is not complete unless it leads them to a life of obeying the commands of Christ. By the way, just to be honest, I think this is where Southern Baptists have kind of, at least over the years, have kind of missed the boat. I mean, how else can you explain a church that has a role of, say, 1,500 people and only 350 people in worship. How do you explain that? Unless there's been a failure to do the second part of the Great Commission. All believers are to be in this process called discipleship. Discipleship is just simply the process of, of where Christians will be transformed into the likeness of Christ. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a lifetime. But if we are a follower of Christ, then we're also called to be a discipler. A discipler. A discipler is one who is involved in helping another disciple to grow in his or her discipleship. It is the idea of coming alongside a brother and sister in Christ and being the one that encourages them to grow in their faith. We must not reduce the Great Commission to a command to share the gospel and to get people to make decisions. Because that's not the whole story. It's an important part of it, but it's not all of it. We need to obey the entire command of the Great Commission. And so for us, we need to ask the question, are we a discipler? Who in your life is someone that you can point to that you are helping them to grow in their faith. You say, well, I haven't been a Christian that long. Or you say, well, I don't know if I have enough training to do this. Well, it doesn't matter. There's somebody who had became a Christian after you did. So there's somebody you can disciple with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are called to be disciplers. We can give words of encouragement. You say, well, how would I, how do I be a discipler? Well, you go to someone and you give them a word of encouragement. Give them a word of scripture. Pr offer to pray with them. Relationship building. Give them a, your time. Serving one another for the purpose of them growing in godliness. Who are you helping to grow as a Christian? Well, I said there would be a third part to the sermon. and We're going we're gonna to close that part. There is from Christ here. After he says, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And then in the last thing he says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What a glorious promise to all the saints of God. He says, Behold. I remember in, in, in New Testament Greek, my professor, he was kind of funny, he he said, that means looky, looky. Whenever you see that word, it means looky, looky. It means pay attention. Take note. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Isn't that powerful? I mean, don't we struggle to do that? If we really understand this great commission, it's a struggle for us. Some of us are, are better at the first, right? Well, I like to tell people about Jesus. Yeah, I like, to, I like to bring them in, right? But you say, well, why, who are you discipling? Well, I, I don't get into that. <laughs> right? There's other people who are like, you know, hey, you know, I, like to, I like to do things in the church and serve people and disciple them, to, you know, help them to grow, whatever. Well, are you going to tell anybody about Jesus? Well, that's not really my thing. Well, 
It's not either or on that either, is it? The Great Commission is make disciples. And we struggle, though. We have all kinds of, kind of excuses, right? I'm too busy. I don't have enough time. Well, I, I don't know if I know the gospel good enough. I don't know if I have enough uh, training to train somebody else. We have fear of rejection. We have fear of failure. But Jesus is saying that through all of these, he will be with us. Whether our struggle is persecution or whether it's our circumstances, Jesus will never leave us. He's always with us, especially, especially when we're obedient in making disciples. The promise of Jesus is, is also to have this effect on us. This happens at our house. It's happened over the years. It particularly happened to our two girls because if you don't know anything about our family, but we have one girl, she's 18, and the next girl is 6, 12 years difference. So it, it, if you want to have your own room in our house, be a girl. <laughs> That's how it worked, okay? And so I remember when Abby was small, and it's happened with Anna now too. It's bedtime, and I hear these little words. Daddy, will you sleep with me? Daddy, will you sleep with me? Why is that? The very presence of one's parents is comforting. Child. Right? And so, inevitably, me or my wife end up <laughs> crawling in bed. Okay, honey, you know, pray with her and talk with her and help her get to sleep. But this promise is to have that same effect with us. We don't have to say... Jesus, will, will you go with me? You don't have to even ask it. He's already promised it. It's as, it, it's as good as done. He, he is with us. He already promised it in his word. Every fear, every struggle that we have in obeying this command should flee when we realize that Jesus has said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You're, here's the deal. You're not alone. If you're in Christ you're not alone. When we witness to unbelieving family members and friends or neighbors, even complete strangers, Jesus is, is with us. When we, when we go about our everyday lives as witnesses, he's with us. When we go across state lines or across uh, the oceans to share the gospel, he is with us. When we try for the third time to follow up with somebody that we had the opportunity to lead to Christ and we're having trouble getting through, he is with us. When we try to explain baptism to someone or explain something from God's Word, the commands of Christ, he is with us. When we study God's Word with other believers, helping others to grow, he is with us. When we hold the hand of another believer and help them to see God's hand at work in their lives. He is with us. When we do the Great Commission, when we make disciples, He is with us. So, our mission flows from Christ's mission. He was sent into the world by the Father and Spirit, and He sends us with this Great Commission. The question is real simple, isn't it? It always is when it comes down to Scripture. If there's a command... What are we supposed to do? Obey. When? Yesterday? No. Tomorrow? No. Now. Right now. You may have failed yesterday. We don't know about tomorrow, but right now. Obey. Jesus says, go make disciples, baptize and teach. That's what we're supposed to do. So the question is, will we, will we obey? Will we teach? Will we baptize? Will we disciple those who embrace Christ? And in that moment, by the way, when you're thinking, it's the Spirit, but in your flesh you're going, should I, should I say something to that person about the Lord? Know this, you are not alone. Jesus is with you, so simply obey. It may come out weird. Uh, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I, I mean, because I, I know, I mean, I've, I've been there, you know. Hey, uh, could, uh, um, the, 
Do you go to church anywhere? I mean, you, we get nervous, right? In that moment, when you go and say, I need, should I say something? Yes, say it. Because he's right there with you. Because I know what's going to happen. You both know what's going to happen if you don't say it. You go down that road and say, well, why don't I just, why don't I just say something? I mean, I knew the Lord was kind of like, lead me that way. Just, I, all right? But in that moment, know that Jesus is with you and simply obey. Yes, speak, share, study, and pray. Lead and love. And know that you are called to be on mission for God. This is our task, church. This is our mission. And we can't afford to let anything distract us from this or compete for our energies and for our efforts. This is why we've been focusing intentionally on, on, on missions. This is why I've preached past the missions conference on missions because I don't want us to let this go. This is the main thing. Jesus said, go into all the world. Make disciples. So let's preach the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. And let's gather his disciples into his church that they may worship the Lord and obey his commands for the glory of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father,